All right. I want to welcome everyone to this GigaOM webinar, webinar, pardon me, uh, Human-Centric Artificial Intelligence, What and Why. That's a lot of syllables and a lot of words. Maybe I can break it down more simply by saying there is a ton of content and discussion and material out there about the technology of AI, um, the tooling, the algorithms, and so forth. Um, and we're, we're certainly excited by all of that, but there is a human side to artificial intelligence in terms of its impact, in terms of how machine learning models are built, because of course that work is done um, by humans as well. And uh, we really see um, that that side of AI needs some attention as well. Our sponsor today is Data IQ. They're very focused on this, not certainly not exclusively, but the, the notion of human-centric AI is, um, is a, a top-line priority for that company, and so we're very happy to have them as sponsors. Uh, specifically, I'll just give you a little introduction to myself and then um, a tiny bit of introduction to our guest, and then I will ask her to... Uh, give us more information. My name is Andrew Brust. I'm an analyst for GigaOM Research focusing on data and analytics and big data and BI and increasingly machine learning and AI. Um, in fact, really all of that is on a, on a spectrum. Um, I've been kind of working uh, in, this, in this industry since the 1980s. I started out in very technical roles uh, entrepreneurial roles. I worked as a CTO for a while for a, uh, a boutique consulting firm, and uh, eventually things pivoted, and I became more of an industry watcher and and so forth. So I get to I get to interview exciting people who have deep deep um, uh, subject matter expertise. Trevani Gandhi is absolutely one such person. She's a data scientist at Data IQ, and I will also mention to you that um, she hosts uh, her own web, web uh, podcast, excuse me, and uh, I imagine we'll learn a little bit more about that. So it's, it's nice to have a, a, fellow, uh, a fellow kind of host and, and talker, if you will. But Trevani, perhaps you could tell us more about what your data scientist role at Data IQ actually involves day to day, and, and maybe also tell us about some of the stuff you did before you got to Data IQ. Sure, thank you, Andrew. Um, so yes, yeah, so I am a data scientist at Data IQ, and uh, for us, that entails something a little bit different than what you might consider a standard approach. Uh, a lot of my work is with clients on helping them create really efficient pipelines and create you know value out of that data using the whole end-to-end, -end, right? It's not just about the the ML part or about the visualizations, but about um, a process that can be efficient and clear and democratic so that all aspects of the business can understand um, what's going on. So that, I mean, that's the majority of the work I do at Data IQ. I mean, I also do stuff like these webinars. I get to do my own projects. It's a lot of fun. Um, and before this, I was actually a data analyst at a nonprofit um, in the education space. And there I was, again, working on a lot of data pipelining and creating sort of descriptive statistics for educators in New York City. And I, my background otherwise is a PhD in political science. So I am coming here from like way out of left field, but um, I love it and I, I love the sort of unique perspective I get to bring because of that. Wow, that is great. and. Uh... <laughs> the audience may be interested to know that although we're in separate rooms and separate buildings, we're both in New York City right now, so um, that's nice. I'm so used to kind of uh, having guests who are on the West Coast, for example. It's right. nice that um, that you're local, and I think one of the things about technology people who work in New York is that uh, they end up working um, pretty closely with customers or or having had come from customers, a little bit different maybe from the Bay Area, let's say, where it's more of an ecosystem of companies that are building things. Um, and uh, I, I'm a little bit parochial, but I like to think that New York is good at both, at building and, and also being really attuned to what customer needs and pain points are. So I'll just put that in as a little bit of uh, 
civic pride. Um, one housekeeping note, we're going to get into the real conversation um, uh, directly here, but I will say as questions come up, please punch those into your go to webinar panel. Um, my policy as much as possible is to integrate questions into the discussion on the fly to the extent that there's a, a deficit. Um, by the time we get to the end of the hour, then we'll also try and whittle those down at the end. But to the extent possible, we like to integrate those into the conversation. Um, we also have uh, a couple of polls as part of this webinar, and um, we're going to get to one of those um, even before the discussion begins. But I'll just point out that we're breaking our discussion down into two sections. The first is really to talk about um, the issues of human-centric AI, uh, both kind of definitions and also um, challenges to um, implementing uh, AI in a human-centric way, uh, and also some upsides uh, of uh, what we have in the current AI and machine learning landscape. That's a mostly, mostly tech-free discussion. We just want to get a sense of the issues, the vocabulary, the concepts, and so forth. We will, though, also address some of the technology because it plays um, directly into this, and specifically, we're going to end up talking about automated machine learning and uh, ML ops to the extent that we feel that that exists. That's kind of a play on DevOps, and we'll get more to that when we get to that part of the discussion. But really, these polling questions are there to help us, if, because this is not, unfortunately, an interactive thing where we're all physically in the same room. We like to try and get a sense of the room through electronic means, if you will. So um, there's no right or wrong answer here. We just like to get a sense of uh, how people are, are feeling about these issues. And so the question is, are you worried about AI's societal impact? And uh, you need to select one of these four multiple choice answers. Um, although uh, they're not 100% mutually exclusive, but if you have a, a, a hard yes or a hard no about being worried, please uh, express that. If you are worried but you're optimistic, that's your third option. And if you're not really worried about AI's societal impact, but you do believe there's some, you know, there's some caveat, there's some caution, there's an asterisk on that no, um, then uh, the fourth option is yours. So having said all that, I will let our crack team launch the poll and we'll give everyone just a little time to buzz in and then Trevania and I will have a better sense of who everyone in our audience is. Yeah. So the poll is up now and yeah, Trevania, you had, you had thoughts? What, what's your... Uh, What's your experience in terms of when you talk to a tech audience that may not be a data science audience, where where do things tend to break down on this question? Yeah, I think actually when it's not so much of a tech audience, I think you get a little bit more of the hard yeses um, because mm -hmm. people don't understand the, they're not techie, so they don't know the actual background or what's going on inside of these models. And for them, it's a little like, oh, this is going to be the Terminator and we're all going to get ruled by a robot. <laughs> so you do get a little bit more of that. Right. Okay. Well, let's see. We're, we're getting good participation. Uh, we'll leave it open for a few more, um, few more moments and then we'll, we'll close the poll and, and um, display those, uh, those instant gratification results. Well, we're getting we're getting nice participation. All right, we're going to close it up now, and we'll take a look at the um, at the at the results. And there's more yeses than noes, but it's not it's not super extreme. Um, and likewise on the more qualified answers. So it seems like we 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 split down maybe not the exact middle, but there's good representation on both sides. So that's. Great, and with that, let's actually launch the discussion. And again, our first section is to talk about concepts and issues. Um, and Trevani, is it the case that a lot of these uh, points come up on your on your podcast? And if so, do you you know it's it's fine to have bullets on a slide, but maybe you could you could uh, inventory you know some of the common concerns and some of the more optimistic sentiment that's out there. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, um, 
our, our podcast is focused on news and uh, upcoming things that are happening in the AI ML space, and we sort of discuss implications on a broader level of those things. So a lot of these sort of fears and hopes have actually emerged as, as discussion points. Um, one thing that's interesting, you know, we talk about AI, um, and as I was mentioning just now, people like to see AI and say, oh, you mean like, you know, robots and all of that. But really, we have to distinguish between practical AI and, you know, sort of traditional sort of futuristic AI. And I think the space we're in right now is focused on practical AI. Yes, there are people building robots and like, you know, those, I don't know if you've seen the Boston dynamic things that can like jump up and open doors. Um, all of that's going on, sure, on the side, but in our day-to-day -day lives, practical AI is much more relevant and is already integrated in a, in a lot of ways. So the fear that, you know, our jobs are gonna get eliminated and we're gonna lose control um, or, or become dumber, right? That's, to an extent, that's not going to happen because we already, already are using a lot of AI in our lives and those things haven't happened yet, right? Um, well, you can debate with me, I guess, on whether or not our smartphones have made us dumber or not, but um, that's that's a separate issue. Um, so I think, in fact, if we give um, AI a, a good opportunity, it can create new kinds of jobs. Um, of course, that is a much more systematic change that has to happen, right? When you think about, um, okay, now we're going to start building robots who do certain tasks for us. Well, then we need people who can build the robots, who can do maintenance, who can sort of troubleshoot them. So that creates a new set of jobs, a new class of, of AI workers. Um, but then that also requires a level of education that might not exist right now in our, in our society. So these fears, I think, you know, aren't really well-founded um, as, as they are right now, but if we don't acknowledge that these, like there is an underlying fear here, we won't actually build towards um, a world that doesn't let them come true, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I think, I mean, I think there's, there's a sentiment out there that, that AI is somehow um, a ticket to some dystopian future. Right. And I think what you're saying is that's, at the very least that's overblown <laughs> and yes. maybe it's just not accurate but i think you are, you're also pointing out that you know it will bring change and it may eliminate certain jobs as it creates others but jobs and skill sets aren't necessarily fungible so uh it's not you know it's not a trivial matter for someone whose position might be eliminated to then kind of cross train and go into something something else necessarily. We have seen that as a you know as a as a feature of technological change before, right? Right. And that's I mean that you have a written here, you know, history as a guide. And I think that's definitely the case, right? Um, you know, when the automobile industry took off, right? Or the Industrial Revolution took off in general, people were brought into the factories, they were taught this is how you do XYZ. Um, and they were able to to create new jobs and actually create new lives for themselves. And um, sort of tangentially related, I know that Toyota in um, in Japan has actually invested a lot of effort into training their employees on the new technologies as they start implementing them, so that they can actually be um, up to speed and feel sort of committed and value valued as as employees. So. Not that you know the training and all of that is on the onus of the the company itself, but rather that we right, should right. be acknowledging that this can change a lot. And if we aren't, as a whole or as a society, trying to think more broadly about how we can, um, if we if we're not thinking about that as a society, how this is going to change, um, then we're not going to actually go into a, a good AI future, right? Or not the best AI future we could have for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I think that's well said. And look, I think for most companies, you know, the it's far cheaper, quite honestly, for, you know, forget sort of altruism, just plain old efficiency and self-interest. It's much it's much cheaper to be able to retain existing people and and help them make a transition than it oh. is, you know, to recruit a new. Um that's 
that's totally disruptive for the, you know, for the organization. So, but, you know, it doesn't happen by itself. As as you kind of implied, it, there needs to be some purposeful planning around that. And, and, and it's that, you know, it's awareness around some of these issues that I think it makes sense to, to raise. And I, I think that's what we're trying to do with this discussion among other, among other goals. Um, you know, I, I came out of, uh, university in the in the late 80s and at that point there was a huge amount of sentiment that you know uh, as PCs back then were getting more widely deployed that whole classes of jobs would go away mm -hmm. and you know there were I, I, I could give you some edge cases like um, you know a couple of places where I, I knew that uh, an office employed you know uh, a couple of people whose entire job it was to receive faxes and then send out other faxes and you know certainly workflows like that got automated but i i and companies definitely wanted to um pare down their their workforce and their payroll but i didn't see that happen <laughs> and, and a lot of new jobs did get created yeah go ahead maybe i'm yeah. oversimplifying oh no 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 i think i think you're spot on right that that's where the ai for augmentation um comes in right where we say okay now we've sort of um, automated things that are that are silly that really don't require your brain as much, and that way right. you, as you know, an analyst or as maybe someone on the business end, can actually start making better decisions. Can let the sort of AI do things that are not as as fun, so that you can do the the stuff that you're good at and that you want to do to help drive value. Um, you know, I can't imagine that there are folks who are biting at the chomp to um, fax, you know, collect faxes back and forth. Um, maybe yeah. there was something more they wanted. And so being able to automate some of that stuff and put it into the background so we can focus in on um, the things that we know and use our intelligence in the right way. I think that's that's a much uh, brighter future for AI. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, all right. Well, I mean, I think we mapped out the general terrain here, which is that some some fears are well founded. And by the way, even when fears aren't well founded, it's it's human nature to react to change with some apprehension. And I I, I don't think we ought to condemn that. I think we ought to be sensitive to it. It's just it's a normal thing, and people right. you know people need some guidance there. Um, but there's there's upside here. There are legitimate concerns. Um, there are probably some illegitimate concerns that are well overplayed, but there are some legitimate ones. And but there's there's also upside, and and history kind of teaches us that these things are not as uh, ominous as they appear. Um, nor should they just be disregarded. Let's drill down a little bit on you know um, machine learning models. Um, and as a data scientist, maybe you can explain what a model really is. Um, mm -hmm. But we do get a sense that at least in some industries that, that certain decision-making processes are being, are being delegated um, to models. You know, maybe it's maybe around judging a, an insurance claim or, um, gosh, maybe even doing some triage through resumes i'm making stuff up so i'll ask you to correct me where you think uh i'm i'm trying in incorrect examples but um to the extent that models are being used to uh, help us with the volume of decision making we have to do um what what are the what are the sort of dangers around the model being you know accurate and helpful versus creating sort of injustice, whether unwittingly or not. Mm -hmm. And how can how can lay people, even technical lay people, but certainly non-technical lay people, how can they actually scrutinize these models to know, you know, what's inside? Yeah, wow, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, the first thing I'm gonna say is that one of the things we do on the podcast is a little segment called In English, Please, and that's where we explain complex data science um, terms in just plain English. And so one of the, what, you know, when you're saying, can you explain what a model is, what came to mind is something like that. So if I were to explain what is a model in basic English, it's essentially a series of weights, right? Weights meaning 
just numbers that are assigned to certain um, variables. And when you see like there's a one on this um, indicator, so this person has one car, well, the weight for your income level, if I'm trying to predict your, predict your income level, is you know 0.2. So I see that you have a you have one car, so your income level goes up by 0.2 of whatever unit that we're in. Um, so that's like just the very base base level. Models are essentially giant like matrices of numbers that um, assign weights and let us know how we can expect certain outcomes based on the inputs. So in that sense, they they are they can be quite you know obtuse, right? They're, they're, they can be black boxes, um, especially when you think about things like neural nets and um, deep learning, where you really cannot understand what's going inside. Um, there are some models like random forest or regression that are very common and actually give us some insights into okay why what what variables are important for this model what are the factors that seem to matter most so when we talk about transparency and interpretability um, i like to ground it in a in a real world example which is um loan loan predictions so you know a lot of banks will do you know a, a model or run some numbers to say hey we think the likelihood that you'll default on this loan is pretty high and so we can't give it to you right and Obviously, that is a place where regulation is important, um, not only for transparency, but also, again, to acknowledge biases. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of insurance companies or lending, lending companies will say, I need to know why did the model make this decision on this person? So mm -hmm. uh, now you see a lot of mathematically, you know, innovations coming out to help interpret why a certain outcome was predicted specific to that outcome, right? And so um, I'm gonna throw out some, some technical terms here, but the idea is that there's something called Lime, um, there's something called SHAP, there's you know new kinds of like deep insights, deep exploration that allow you to actually get a sense mathematically of what's going on inside the model that has um, contributed to this prediction, right? So if I see that you know I was de denied a loan, well, it looks like the fact that my debt to debt to rate, debt to income ratio is really high was the major contributing factor for that prediction. Um, so if I go and run that off a little bit, maybe I can actually become um, eligible for this loan, right? So in some ways, we can use transparency there to actually understand at a you know outcome by outcome basis what's going on. But something I do talk a lot about with um, with clients, right, is the trade-off between built-in transparency. So, like I said before, a neural network, right, or deep learning is not going to have transparency at its baseline. But things like random forest and regression, you can at least see variable importance, um, or you can see the path that the, the flow of decision-making is taking. So, if you're dealing with two models, right, and one is 98% accurate, but completely, like, unknowable, it is a total black box, and the other one's 95% accurate, but it's a gray box maybe, maybe it's not fully transparent, but it's a gray box, um, what do you need, right? Do you need to be able to get it absolutely correct 98, 99% of the time, but you don't care what's happening inside? Okay, fine, maybe you do need you know, that neural net, but if being able to understand why the decisions are being made the way they are is important, and I think as we'll argue a little bit later on with monitoring, I think it is important. You know, a 3% difference here is not that big of a deal. It's okay, I think, sometimes to sacrifice accuracy in the name of transparency. And I think that's how we can actually move forward better with more transparent models that then in turn can help reduce biases. Okay, wow, that, <laughs> there know, that is a lot there. So yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, it's, I, I said it's a lot. It's I, obviously I think about this all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, that, and that's why you're here. Um, so, I mean, I've also heard kind of from the business side, people say that accuracy, you know, trying to get to the, the last drop of accuracy out may be a bad choice if it means it's going to take 
the model, if it's going to take a much longer time to build the model, that, you know, just for time to value, um, accuracy can actually be a spoiler. And I think what you're saying here is accuracy can even be a spoiler to, um, to transparency. I guess the, the more highly engineered something is, it might be less interpretable and also um, more expensive. <laughs> it's kind right. of interesting. Um, that and also more more prone to error, right? Because then you're really going to overfit to get that exact number um, on your testing data right. and then start giving it real data. So, I mean, you know, the common saying is garbage in, garbage out. So you you have here on the slide that there is bias. Bias models will start with biased data, right? And so if your data itself isn't very good, you know, no amount of retooling and engineering is going to get it to a 99% accuracy. So the mm -hmm question has to start earlier on in the pipeline um, if you really want to get that high level of accuracy that is also unbiased yeah there are, it's it's sort of ironic here because there are some vendors out there who talk about taking dirty data and cleansing it using machine learning um, so <laughs> if that's if that's valid then we can almost use machine learning to help have better machine learning, but I, I'm I'm a little I'm a little skeptical. Um, I don't know As what you think about that. Go ahead. No, no, I am also quite skeptical of that. It's only because you know a machine learning model is going to look at dirty data and not understand the context, right? Or if it looks at data and it sees, oh, okay, there's you know, in this data set of a hundred people, three of them are coded female and 97 are coded male it's not gonna register that as, hey, that doesn't make sense given that our population is about 50-50 male women, right? It's just gonna see it as like, oh, okay, that's just like the nature of this situation and it's gonna build that bias in. That's why you know, we need human insights. That's why AI should be augmented by actual humans who understand context and society and can actually see bias. Um, I'd love to have someone invent a ML sort of machine learning thing that can pick up on biases. But until then, you know, we need to be in the data. We need to know our data. Otherwise, we're going to really do a disservice to ourselves. Yeah, that makes that makes sense too. I mean, obviously machines can compute a lot more efficiently maybe than humans can, but humans can do extremely complex, high level kinds of analyses, right? There's just <laughs> the idea that you can eyeball data and 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 use experience and intuition to understand that there may be something um, lacking in its integrity. I mean, gosh, I don't know how long we'll have to wait before before machine judgment can get that sophisticated. I wonder if if it may ever happen. So that's kind of a self-referential uh, uh, observation. Um, so we got to get the data better. That's that's one thing. But what, what about the makeup of the teams um, yeah. who are building the models? You're a data scientist. I mean, <laughs> what's your what's your take on on how you know how diverse or not or or more homogeneous data science teams tend to be? Um, mm -hmm. And is that is I don't know is that is that problematic? Uh, and how else can we bring you know, people into this. A couple ideas on the slide. Um, you know, what can we do kind of socially to uh, have a check and a balance against the automated side of all this? Right. Yeah. So um, it, it's interesting, right? Uh, we talk about tech having a diversity problem, and data science is a part of tech, right? Data science does have a diversity problem. You will see um, a lot more people who are male and who are white um, sitting in those rooms making decisions that impact a lot of people who don't look like themselves, right? And so it's not only about, I, I think, you know, we, we tend to gravitate um, towards sort of race and gender, but even beyond that, it's about people of different classes, of different upbringings, of different backgrounds that can actually bring in insights to to explain wait a minute the way you're approaching this is completely off base it's based on you know what you think is happening but i've actually been on the ground and seen it um and so i mean i have a, i have a ton of examples in mind so i don't want to i don't want to go through all of them but really being able to say hey you are a person who's 
you know, you, you are like the kind of people who are going to be using this or being affected by this algorithm. What do you think is going on here? Is this the right way to approach it? Um, and not just sort of bringing people in at the end to be like, sign off on this now for me, but really involving diverse kinds of people from all sorts of quadrants, right? Um, beyond just race and gender, but bringing in people from diverse quadrants at the beginning of the process and engaging them constantly throughout is really important, especially if we want AI to do, have a good social impact versus, versus not. Right. Yeah. And what about this idea of a review board? I mean, is oh. that, is that, is that sort of a pipe dream because people without the, the technical background just can't be expected to, you know, to, to, to act in, in an oversight capacity or, 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 or maybe that's the case now, but maybe, maybe later, uh, models can be, can be, I don't know, visualized or otherwise, um, articulated in a way where, where lay people can, like how, yeah. so I how, think how naive or, or reasonable are some of these things? Yeah. So I think two things, um, I, I do want to talk about the data sets being peer reviewed. Um, but, but since you first mentioned the civilian re review board, I, I believe that having some sort of oversight governance body is really important, right? Not only as we move into a world that's more and more dictated by AI, but also so that we as data scientists, we as data practitioners can say, okay, am I actually holding myself up to the best standard that I can, right? There needs to be a standard set somewhere. Um, and having some sort of over oversight or governance is really important. I don't think we should discount the lay person's ability to understand the impact of AI on their lives and thus be able to sort of tease out implications and be able to review in that way. Okay, yeah, maybe they're not gonna be able to calculate the matrix of coefficients by hand, but at least they can understand that, hey, that model, because of that model, I've been denied a car loan or because of that model, this person was jailed longer than they should have been. Um, they can understand that, right? Or, you know, they can be at least taught the basics of data science and machine learning such that they can make good decisions for, you know, for a broader population. And I, and I, again, I don't think civilian review board has to be only, you know, non data science people, right? So it's just like, you know, the guy who works down the street and whatever, but, but those folks who do not look like the data scientists in the room who come from different backgrounds should be helping to oversee, but it should be a partnership, right? It shouldn't come across as like, these are these people who don't know anything about this space regulating us um, versus, oh, these are the same, these are the people who work in the space who are self-regulating and maybe not actually being over, you know, overseen correctly. So there has to be a union there that's, that's a real partnership and not sort of seen as antagonistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll and, just say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'll just add an observation, which is, you know, in my, in my years in tech, what I've noticed as a general pattern is that tech companies tend to be, um, you know, tend, tend to be uh, uh, resistant to regulation oh, as yeah. a general matter. Yeah. Um, because it, whatever, I mean, obviously it, 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 it puts more, it puts more hops in the, <laughs> in the network of getting a product out the door and marketing it and so forth. But what I've seen in the case of AI, it, I've actually seen instances where technology companies are saying they're actually raising awareness for the need to have regulation. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect it's because they don't feel at all ready to kind of um, take that full responsibility on themselves. They want to make sure that their competitors are held to the same standard. Um, and also probably they want to increase the public's confidence in machine learning technology and AI, uh, mm -hmm. because that'll, you know, that'll make for more economic opportunity, quite frankly. I, 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 have you seen any of this or is, is that all? Is that no. all kind of foreign to you? No, I think I think it's actually become a lot more prevalent now in the past few years after sort of the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Um, I think right. companies are now starting to realize that, oh, wow, we actually have a lot of 
power and that power does need to have responsibilities attached to it. Um, so one thing I saw recently was that I believe it was Tesla or it was some company of Elon Musk's that had um, created an algorithm that could actually create fake news, right? And generate not untrue news, news briefs that read like true ones. Um, and right. he very purposefully shut it down and did not release sort of anything with it because they, they recognized the huge implications it could have for, for what, uh, what's going on in the world. And so it, right. it was, um, a conscious effort on their choice to say, okay, this is really cool tech, but what is, what are the implications? What is the really, what can really happen? What harm could come from this? Um, so to see that, to see, you know, um, companies, at least like in California, you know, you're seeing more governance around data privacy. You're seeing companies starting to kind of understand that, okay, we do have um, some some roles here. We have a role to play um, and then becoming a little bit more aware is really important. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Let's, let's move on now. And um, I promised we'd talk a little bit about the technology itself. So here's a poll leading into that. And unlike the first poll where <clears throat> you had to pick just one, here you can select all that, that apply. Uh, does machine learning technology help or hinder transparency and human centricity? Um, so your first option is no, really. ML tools are too focused on model design and, and training. I didn't put the model, the word model in there, but it's implied. Um, production tools are helping by tracking model accuracy. Um, maybe you disagree with the premise of the question. <laughs> this isn't about the technology. It's, it really is about the social side. And um, here, here is if you, if you have real strong feelings about the kind of ecosystem we've built so far, uh, the industry needs a reboot to orient its technology towards responsible AI. Um, and no offense taken if uh, anyone checks that box. So let's launch the poll, or it's already launched, and we'll wait to see. Again, check all that apply. So we're going to have uh, bars that add up to more than 100, obviously, and we'll see what's what. Um, you know, it's interesting. One thing that, uh, while well, folks during the poll, uh, you had on the last slide, you had sort of the data data review, data peer reviewing. There is something that uh, I've, I've spoken about on, on the podcast, Banana Data. Um, there's a, a group out of MIT that is creating something called the Data Nutrition Project. So very similar mm -hmm. to having a nutrition label on a candy bar before you eat it. Um, they're ah, starting to nutrition labels around your data set before you use it. But hey, by the way, it was made by, you know, it came from this person. It was done in this way. You know, here are some potential missing elements to it. Um, so, so there are, I mean, people are getting creative, right? Um, and I think we mm -hmm. should be pushing ourselves to be, to be a little bit more so. Yeah, yeah, I, that's that's encouraging. Um, I would say though that as much as people are getting creative, it, it's very ad hoc right now. There's not, <laughs> there's certainly not a lot of standards or or even industry conventions yet around that stuff and that that's okay but we probably need to get there before before too too long um, maybe we'll see a consortium that more and more vendors join into for example um, let's see how we're doing on this poll um, we're getting we're getting there I guess people may have less strong feelings about this question than a, about the first but in any case we'll probably close the voting pretty soon so um, everyone ought to, ought to get ready and uh, then we can get into talking about some of the tech. All right, so why don't we, um, why don't we go ahead and close that and see the results and we'll move on. Hmm. Uh, all right, this isn't about technology, it's about people as the, the largest percentage of answers. That's right. good, or I, I mean good in the way that and that it's interesting. Um, I also think uh, it looks like we have some questions in the queue. Those will get funneled to me shortly and I'll try and bring them in. Um, but uh, let's see. 
not not so many people feel the industry needs a reboot. I wonder if that's because we're a self-selected crowd or if, or if people are really super satisfied with the way things have uh, gelled so far. Yeah, or maybe because we're already talking about it so much. You know, we're starting to, we've already sort of reoriented that way. I don't know if that's necessarily the case, but maybe that's what folks are thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, it, it, we definitely seem to have a crowd that, that seems a little bit more optimistic and, and a little less skeptical. Not 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 in any kind of blind allegiance though. But uh all right. So we'll we'll move on to uh the next section here and again how the tech can help or you know conversely maybe how it's how it's contributing to some issues. So the first thing we want to talk about here is automated machine learning. There's different um there's different definitions out there. I might submit to you as a minimal definition, AutoML is about um, mm -hmm. is about an automation of selecting an algorithm and tuning the so-called hyperparameter values for that algorithm to build a model. That is, you know, I would say there's lots of things to do in machine learning in terms of, you know, inferencing and running tests and validating and developers can do most of it, but in terms of picking algorithms and hyperparameter values, um, there's some rules of thumb you can follow, but uh, maybe those aren't so great. And even if so, you know, maybe the due diligence is about trying lots of different combinations and, and checking for accuracy or processing timing and, and, and getting, getting the best output. Now, you're a data scientist. I've met other data scientists. I even had the um, privilege of <clears throat> interviewing Hillary Mason. And then, and this very subject came up. So I will say that Hillary Mason was um, somewhat skeptical around automated machine learning, um, wondering what your thoughts are on it. And also, if you feel a different definition is in order, please uh, go ahead and, and sound off. Well, it's interesting because, you know, now that there's this like big push around auto ML, it reminds me of a couple years ago when everyone was all about big data. Um, mm -hmm. and it was, it was quite funny because now people realize that big data can mean so many different things. Um, right. and so I think auto ML is the same thing here, right? You need to figure out what it's going to mean for you and thus be able to decide, is this going to be good or bad for me? So the way you've defined it here, you know, it, it seems quite, quite basic, quite, um, baseline auto ML. And I think this is the amount of auto ml that i as a data scientist am comfortable with right where it's here are some algorithms here are hyperparameters i'm going to try all of them for you and then from that um you know the 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 machine is going to say okay i think this one's the best but ultimately it is my decision as a data scientist which one gets deployed which one gets used and that's actually how um i've, I've used auto ml in my own work at, at data iq where I can say, okay, I've tried it out in all these different ways. I know that technically this model has the highest score, but this is the model that I can actually understand, or that's going to be, you know, able to tell a story. That's the one that's going to go ahead and get deployed. Um, and it's nice too because you can use that auto ML to create a baseline. So if I don't do anything, if I just let a machine try it all out on its own, what is the best I can expect? And then how can I beat that with my own insight, with my own knowledge, with my own sort of fine tuning of things? So in that sense, as long as, long as we're using auto ML as, again, a supplement or as like a starting point, I think it can be safe. I think it can help with all of these issues that we've been talking about. Um, but if we say, if we look at auto ML as like this giant thing, which is the most, um, you know, most encompassing, it finds the best model, it deploys it, it retrains it, all of that stuff. Um, that's where I think we can get into dangerous territory and we want to stay away from. Fair enough. We have some questions from the audience, uh, one or two here. Uh, well, I imagine you'll have some strong views here, but the first one is how likely is it that AI and ML, and there, there's a verb missing, but I think the implied the verb is go, beyond niche applications? So maybe I can take some liberties there and rephrase this a little bit. Um, to, 
to what extent are you finding customers using ML technology in a in a mainstream way versus uh, a more niche um, application of the technology? And I imagine that you know varies by customer, et cetera. But where 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 do you think uh, enter enterprises and industry is with respect to this question yep. of AI ML going mainstream? Or yeah, I think. I, I already think it's gone mainstream, right? We just don't realize it. Um, it is already so embedded in our lives and in so many enterprises. So I can think of a lot of my clients, you know, who are doing things with predictive maintenance, um, things with different kinds of marketing strategies, um, email email campaigns, uh, figuring out which customers are likely to churn. You know, these are just sort of like off the top of my head. Um, but there's a lot of use cases that that aren't industry specific. And so things like predictive maintenance um, of, of machinery that might break down, well, you know, you need that in the auto industry, you might need that in the, the airplane industry, you might need that in even like oil and gas where there's, um, you know, mechanisms and components that need to be constantly monitored. So there are, there are places there, there are places where um, AI and ML are being used for social good um, so one group that we partner with is called the Ocean Cleanup Project, and they're quite well known um, for helping getting uh, plastics and trash out of the ocean. They are actually using AI, they're using machine learning techniques to pinpoint where, they're, where they need to go next to figure out the best place to extract a large volume of, of trash from the ocean. So we've already gone beyond it, right? It's It's a matter of now how are we going to use it in a way that's um, best for us as, as a society as a whole? Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty pretty interesting. So, uh, gosh, so there's, there's some questions on this slide that we haven't spoken to yet, and then um, at least one more in the queue here. Uh, well, I'll, you know what, I'll bundle in the, the audience question with some of the stuff on the slide. So the audience question is, whether this notion of a civilian review board, have you, have you seen that adopted or even considered? Um, and then on the slide, just to kind of shove two things together, with respect to automated machine learning, it seems like on the one hand, it can be very liberating, um, and both for the, maybe for the non-data scientists, but uh, as you've made clear, for data scientists as well, because you can you can just kind of check through lots more combinations, even if the ultimate decision lies with you. But you know, uh, can it also get if used incorrectly? Can it cause problems? Can it mm -hmm. can it be a threat to transparency and accuracy? Um, or and and you know, if we're talking about AI replacing people, do you think auto ML <laughs> might replace data scientists? Um, so that. Uh, Gee, I dumped a whole lot on your lap, but feel free to take things one at a time. <laughs> yeah, so starting with the civilian review board, I mean, I think this is a conversation that is just now starting to to make circles, uh, to make its way around, you know, the tech circles and sort of this industry right. stuff. Um, I know that Google and Facebook recently sat down a consortium. Some There was a big consortium of all these big tech guys who said, well, these are the standards we want to implement for model accuracy across the board. Okay, which is quite different from a civilian review board. But I think I think these conversations are starting to emerge. You know, we've seen civilian review boards um, in other kinds of places, right? You know, a common one is the police force, right, where we have um, folks who are reviewing body cam footage or something. There's also, you know, there are congressional um, groups that review, you know, science, the National Science Foundation grants, or different kinds of work that is um, constantly being monitored and regulated by people outside of their specific scope. So I don't think it's too much of a reach given the way AI is going in our in our lives to say, we need to be doing this kind of reviewing at some point. Um, so I, I, would, I would love to see more, more examples of other folks in this space talking about it. I've really really only kind of heard it from us, um, my, myself. Um, but, you know, I'd love to be proven wrong on that and to, to hear yeah, that. The well, maybe we're on to something here. Maybe maybe we'll break some news, but but anyway, yeah. And then now you're saying, will auto ML replace data scientists? Well, I mean, again, this is so, so much of this is up to us as data practitioners. Are we going to let 
not are we going to let ourselves be replaced, but are we going to let AI run wild or are we going to use AI as a tool, right? So like um, assembly line robots didn't really replace, um, I mean, it did replace some amount of factory workers, but then we also started using them in different ways and creating a new generation of people who knew how to actually use the robots or prepare the robots or whatever it was um, without totally replacing them. And so this kind of goes back to our first, our first sort of conversation about training and keeping people up to speed. Uh, one, I don't think AutoML will, will replace data scientists in, in the way you think of like, oh, I'm out of a job now, but more so it'll push us to be a little bit more um, nuanced and specific in the way we approach our tasks. But two, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic, I'm a bit of a pessimist, and I don't think AutoML should be the, the standard in the future, right? It should be, this is a baseline, this is something that's here to help me, but to say, all right, the machine, this machine learning model has been selected as the best, it's been deployed, it's constantly being monitored, we know that it's feeding data back in and re-upping itself. I mean, sure, if you wanna do that, okay. Should that be the industry standard? I don't think so. All right. Uh, that is, it, we're 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 happy to have kind of strong, candid opinions here. So we've got <laughs> one. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's cool. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, and what about kind of uh, the helper, the hindrance to transparency, bias, and accuracy with auto mm -hmm. ML? Or do you think it's kind of net net no impact? No, I do think auto ML can. If we can start building auto ML with these goals in mind, I do think it could actually improve, right? I think right now the the draw of auto ML is like point and click, you're done, don't have to think about it, don't have to waste time on it. So in that sense, right. we're trying to optimize it for like efficiency and ease of use. But if we say, okay, we're gonna use auto ML, but we're going to use it for certain ends, then we'll build it right. out in a way that is geared towards those things. Yeah, I think that makes sense. In other words, it can be used. Uh, it can be used to just, um, on the one hand, you know, tur turn something into a a task into being more trivial. But what it can also do, and maybe it's more important, is it can it can make things more rigorous. Um, right. If you use it as an augmenting tool rather than you know uh, delegating <laughs> all the work to it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. It's cool. Uh, if you use a hammer for a nail, good. If you're using a hammer on your thumb, maybe not so good. Maybe not, yeah, that hurts. Uh, all right, one more kind of technology uh, topic here. We've got about five or six minutes left. And that's this notion of ML ops, kind of a play on DevOps. The, the idea that, you know, instead of a data scientist perhaps working on her laptop and a Jupyter notebook and doing everything in a very bespoke fashion saying okay now the model looks good i'm going to i'm going to manually you know deploy it up to some cloud platform for make it available as a web service for inferencing that we can a lot of that deployment work and a lot of the monitoring work can actually um be engineered and uh controlled and and orchestrated by software. And part of what we can do there is not just automate, you know, this isn't just about, um, this isn't just about constant deployment, but it's also about um, tracking the experiments that might be done as you're building the model and then uh, keeping, keeping a, an electronic eye on the model's accuracy uh, this notion of data drift, which maybe you can explain. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I hear lots of people talking about the need for retraining. I don't know necessarily that it gets that much attention. It seems like once a model's deployed, then maybe the data science team is pressured to move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, and probably under pretty crazy timelines and a lot of pressure. So, uh, how do we make sure those models get retrained is, and, you know, is, is technology that might automate that on a scheduled or other basis helpful here? How, how much of this is science fiction? How much of it is real? And, 
to what extent has stuff like this been adopted? Right. So you are seeing some places now um, integrating things like what you're talking about here with um, auto sort of auto deployment and checking monitoring of of the model itself, checking it against the data, looking for sort of um, any potential breaks in in the overall accuracy. Um, and with data drift, right? Data drift meaning that you're maybe you get data that just no longer fits the schema of what's expected. So the whole pipeline breaks or the data itself could come in, start coming in biased, right? Because we didn't realize that this bias was going to get built into the data pipeline or something, um, which in turn then kind of messes up your model, right? Because you're retraining your model with new data as it's coming in, but that data itself is is problematic. Um, so I, I, I do see that the industry, there are folks in this industry moving towards this sort of um, automated ML ops. Uh, whether or not that's the best way forward, I think, again, is going to depend on your, your situation. So like you're saying, there's data scientists who build out a product and then they need to go on to the next one. So they can't be constantly looking back. Um, I do think that if you have some sort of system in place where folks who might not be the data scientists themselves, but at least understand the implications of what's happening with these models, um, to be able to monitor and check in on the models as they're retraining and, and doing data drift and all of that, I think that's important, right? So taking it from the data scientist's hands, deploying it to uh, an auto ML you know, ops who's just, the, the auto ML ops is gonna go ahead and check everything and assume that everything's fine is a problem. But to say that, okay, we're taking it out of the data scientist's hands, we're giving it over to a set of monitoring tools, but there are real live humans who understand what's going on, you know, what the implications of these, these models are. Um, there are real live humans on the other side of this monitoring who are making sure that it, it stays relevant and fresh, right? And we don't create more problems for ourselves. Um, and so part of that goes again back to training and education of your employees but also um, an acknowledgement that this is not going to be a, a one, you know, one and done kind of solution, that it does require our involvement and our participation to be most efficient, most effective. All right, sounds like there's a lot around, you know, methodology and, and practices yeah. that's gonna be, you know, that's really up to the, the customer, the, the the organizations that are adopting AI, it's a lot is going to be up to them in terms of what becomes reasonable and customary and therefore, you know, makes machine learning and AI more or less, uh, I don't know, governed and, and ultimately palatable to society. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit indeterminate. We'll have to see how it, how it works out but uh, hopefully we've done our little part to um, raising some awareness of some of these issues and, and make, making clear that this is not all about, you know, products and, and tech. Um, certainly they, they play a big role, but it's ultimately a teaming of human and machine, which <clears throat> is actually what we're saying about AI overall. So um, that applies in a couple of different matters. Um, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, it seems like we kept up with the questions, so that's good. Um, this was a really good discussion. I, I learned a lot, uh, and that's, I don't know, that's sort of my KPI for how good a webinar it was. Um, that's a little narcissistic, I suppose, but I, <laughs> I figure <clears throat> if I'm learning stuff, then, uh, then hopefully the audience is as well. Um, really enjoyed having you on and uh, hope uh, we might be able to repeat this. I'm gonna thank the audience as well for tuning in and contributing questions and considering all of these issues. And for GigaOM, this is Andrew Bruss saying thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.